don't know if it's live yet. It says it's live, but it seems to be... Oh, here we go. Is it working? It's live yet. It says it's live, but it seems to be... Ooh. Oh, here we go. There we are! So then, welcome all of you kiddies and adventurous seekers to the live AMA with Greg Broadmoor, Richard Taylor, and Brian Saliba on the side. This is the most adventurous tea party I've ever been to, I must say. Why don't you say hello to all the eager viewers out there? G'day everyone, it's yeah. lovely to be chatting to you from New Zealand. As you see, Dr. G headquarters. I'm very privileged to be sitting with the creator of the world of Dr. Grawbots, Greg Broadmore, and of course, uh, our dear friends over there in the US, Brian and uh, Tyler, and uh, our huge thanks and compliments to them for inviting us along today. Fantastic, yeah. Yes, Beautiful these day two here. are the <laughs> true power behind Dr. Grawbot, I guess you might say. The, the boffins who have created all of his greatest inventions that he can sell us to the public. <laughs> now then, we are going to cover just a few questions that we have prepared, and we will also be taking some questions from the chat if you are interested in pos posing anything related to the Dr. Drawboard universe. If you have any mechanical questions, that's more something you should post on the Kickstarter. Brian Saliba is very ready for those questions. So... Greg and Richard, are you ready? Well, let's dive into it. We're excited. Good. Why don't you tell us about the origins of Dr. Grodbord? How did it come to be and how did Weta get involved? Good question. So I've been at Weta for about 20 years now. Richard started Weta Workshop maybe 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was very lucky to join about 20 years ago um, doing various projects. I started on King Kong and other things. And I'm uh, in my fair time when i come home from making movies i would be working on various science fiction projects in my in my spare time and uh dr gorbots was just a oh god i realize how fucked i am in the head. how long ago it was yeah well look uh, it, it's amazing because literally on the wall over here is the original painting it's hidden behind alien there can you see if you can actually lift the painting off the wall yeah, yeah. oh there we go and uh, Greg actually gifted me this. This is an oil painting that he painted uh, up at the house that Greg used to live in just up the road before he moved out uh, and moved into uh, into his home. But um, I saw this painting and uh, and I said to Greg, holy hell, that's extraordinary. What's the world behind that? And uh, he said, well, give us a week. I'll come back to you and tell you a bit about it. And one week later, um holy he uh he proceeded to unfold this extraordinary vision for this incredible world so that that was sort of dr g coming to inception yeah as you can see it's inspired by science fiction of the 20s and 30s that was what i grew up on before i ever saw star wars as a kid i saw the black and white serials of of buck rogers flash gordon and of course all the serials of the 1920s and 1930s like uh, and the um adventure films like tarzan king kong and the world of Dr. Drawboards grew out of that, specifically the ray guns. It all started with the ray guns, weirdly enough, which is a weird way to design a science fiction world. But there's something mesmerizing about the ray gun and what it does. It is like that talisman of magic and science together. Um, and yeah, there's infinite varieties of them, you know, to explore. And so that's what I did. The first uh, starting point for me was to do a whole bunch of different designs. and. At the time, I think we were working on uh, on Kong, but Richard had this idea that, well, we're always doing licensed projects. Could we come up with some ideas within the workshop that are uh, our own IP, our, our own ideas? And I was working on the ray guns and thought, well, imagine making these as if they're real like, and, and putting them in, like, as you can see one back here, that's the, this is the FMOM. This is the, the real version of it, if you like. And the idea was to make it as if it was an antique something that you could imagine going up into your grandfather's attic and coming across and uh, bringing down and asking like, what's this? And you know, your granddad would say that it's from when they fought, when he fought in the Martian wars, you know? So the whole thing is an object of an, an alternate era 
uh, down to the very last detail. There are tuning forks in there. There are things to update the weapon. There are extra vials of ammunition. This particular one has, comes with a tuning fork for you to make sure the resonance of the ray gun is in just the right, uh, mm -hmm. the right frequency. And uh, yeah, we put crazy level of detail, making them feel like they're antique. I mean, I wanted to put squashed moths and dust in them, which is probably not a great idea, but um, yeah, they, and that really was the starting point of bringing this world to life, but looking at it from now, looking back, yeah. Yeah, obviously our hope and aspiration was to get it out to the wide, widest pop possible population, hopefully in the form of a television series or a film. And we did actually write a script. We did start going down that journey. The challenge, of course, is that it's always limited by your financial capability to carry something through. And we certainly, my wife Tanya and I, um, funded this uh, to the limit of our capabilities, but we sort of petered out a little bit um, and didn't get to really fulfill our, our deepest aspirations. But saying that, we produced, we, we did a lot of publishing, a lot of very high-end collectibles uh, that was much loved by people around the world. And uh, eventually, uh, we came to the attention of Roni Abovitz, the gentleman that would start go on to start magically the mixed reality technology. And he actually commissioned us for eight years to make the first ever um, games. In, and we ultimately made four games. We yeah. actually built a whole department, started off in the workshop, ended up with its own facility because it grew to be over 50 people. And Greg went from a concept artist to a game design game director. Team, game director for those eight years. And that's ultimately where we took it. Yeah, those are very, very exciting. And um, they it's a shame that such a small proportion of people have seen them, but hopefully at some point the, a wider audience will get to see all that work. But it was really quite revolutionary. If anyone out there has heard of Magic Leap or is interested in spatial computing and AR, it's worth looking looking into because it was really quite quite novel work and i think that area of computing and entertainment is going to take off in the future uh we are very very early to it but very very lucky because of that because we got to be explorers of the frontier of it and uh and come up with some new rules and things and yeah a little bit of exciting stuff and we actually got to take these ray guns and put them virtually in your hands where you can look down and see the ray gun in your hand and not in like a vr sense you're literally putting on these goggles and seeing the world around you, looking down and there is a ray gun on the end of your hand. And when you pull the trigger, it blasts and it hits your wall, it sets your couch on fire. And, even, and then you chase robots and even around your house. fires through your wall into another world. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, one of our friends who is one of the world's leading uh, futurists describes the game that Greg and his colleagues made as the, the hyperloop of video games. And I always thought that was a very worthy description because there's been nothing like it since mm. and at the time on the planet. Yeah. All of that TLC yeah, that's really comes to a head. Mm. It's Thank all you. those um, fine details and every little bit in the right place is what makes the difference between splattering an alien creature into a thousand pieces and actually getting something to mount on your wall. So it's greatly appreciated from me, I can say that. Thank you, Tyler. Now, the second yeah. question, because Ray Gun... Were... Hmm? Yeah. 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 You can call Cox me Coxie Sorry. if you prefer. <laughs> sure. Now, the second question was going to be more about the Ray Guns in general, but because you said they were baked in from conception, why don't you just tell us a few of your favourites? Because I know some of them are popular online due to the integration with Team Fortress 2, like the Phlogistonator, the Righteous Bison, and all those. Do you have any particular favorites of your creations? Hmm. Yeah, I I mean, this, that one we were just showing, the FMOM, is one of my favorites because it's a classic ray gun, but it has the Dr. Grudbot insane level of detail on it, which I love. Um, they're always, always supposed to feel like contraptions. Like they're not just the classic, beautiful streamlined ray gun. They're a piece of unwieldy engineering, bleeding edge science in your hands. And so the, the FMOM epitomizes that in a really nice way. The bison, I also love, but that's a bit more, the, the goal there was to make something a bit more rugged and look like it was really for, ready for field use. 
And um, and of course that got to be featured in um, Tier 2, which was amazing. Uh, and they really did something special with it. So those oh, are two of my I, I love the Ray Blunderbuss. Mm. Um, yeah, we, we we made 25 of those, I think. It sold them 50. around 50, was it? Yeah. They sold out all over the world. Um, we, we've got extraordinary letters back from people that have got them. Sadly, one of the we go to exceedingly high levels of care to pack them and ship them in these beautifully custom built wooden crates as if you're getting ammunition from the, the far off uh, reaches of the empire. Uh, but unfortunately, a gentleman that bought one in London, um, it arrived and it had a broken glass vial in it. And uh, he let us know he wasn't upset particularly, but he asked if we would send him another glass vial. So rather than just sending him a repair piece for him to fix, I rang up a friend of mine who uh, can do an extraordinarily good uh, Elizabethan Georgian impression. I sent him a Dr. Grawbort's lab coat. He got himself a um, a Gladstone bag, some uh, historical tools and a bottle of whiskey and literally went and unannounced and knocked on this guy's door and uh, presented himself as uh, the, the doctor, the, 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 um, the Dr. Grawbort's uh, repairman that was turning up to fix this guy's gun. And uh, they end up drinking the whole bottle of whiskey through the evening. Yeah and uh the evening turned into a wonderful piece of theater for the individual so um and that's kind yeah. of the vibe of the whole it is the vibe right with the with the ray guns again you want to feel like you're falling into that world you're part of the story you know there's never even with the exhibition we've had a created a world touring exhibition that's been across china and europe and um then that it's there's no little placards at the bottom that say you know illustrated by greg broadmoor or sculpted by this person or whatever it's it's all presented in universe you step into that exhibition and you're in the world of dr g once again it's a great shame that not many have seen that exhibition we the most in north america insane level that yeah in north america the most insane level it got to was in uh, a city called Wuxian or, or a town called Wuxian outside of Shanghai. It's called the Venice of China. It's a canal city dating back 1400 years. And they literally um, turned that place into a world of Dr. Grawbots. And we put on an exhibition in a hundred year old Bartiking factory and we turned it into a gentleman's explorers club. Uh, complete with Grand Hall, marble mausole mausoleum, a hidden gun room behind a sliding bookshelf, a huge custom-built fireplace, um, an adventurer's room with all of the um, botanical things that Coxswain had found on his journeys around the planets of the solar system. And it, it was acknowledged as the single most significant art exhibition ever to be put on in china and it was bonkers mm. yeah very well i can't blame them for marveling at a few of my trophies <laughs> exactly it's all your hard work there and speaking of trophies Topic. can i ask you what exactly inspired the design for the two kinds of venusian the martians and the moonlings was that one person's design or was it designed by a whole team uh, the team that's of uh, mentalists that are in my head is designed by them, um, and it would it re those those two designs specifically the Venusians actually they're like the classic archetypical uh, alien right like they're the amalgam of you've seen actually this is the most realistic version of the of the Venusian that we've done yet this is a beautiful sculpture I think by um, Jamie Bess Warwick where he took the design which, like I say, is an archetypical sci-fi design. It's like the, the classic trumpet ears, the googly eyes, the tentacle mouth. It's all the cliches of what an alien is supposed to be, right? Show uh, some dignity, you Venusian blighter. <laughs> in this particular version, Jamie brought it to life in, in a realization that is utterly real, I think, taking that, uh, that kind of cliche and bringing it to life in a hyper-detailed uh, yeah, yeah like there is a tiny number of pieces of art that have been done by colleagues of ours in the workshop and 
Also, the graphic design of the website needs to be acknowledged as being done by someone. Hans. Hans, very clever gentleman. But other than that, every single word, every illustration, every diagram, every drawing, the art direction um, has been done by Greg Broadmoor. And uh, when you actually see the body of work and how short a period of time it, uh, it evolved and the level at which it's done at, um, you know, I, I can't stress enough my my bewilderment, awe, and um, thanks to Greg for creating something so incredible. You just look at the three paintings on the back wall, of which two are Dr. Grawbort's paintings. I think Greg did, what, 30 portraits in a similar uh, fashion? I did a hundred of those portraits. Well, a hundred, yeah. 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 So um, there's, there's about a thousand artifacts in the exhibition. Uh, in total. It would be brilliant to bring it to North America sometime. It's oh, a well, colossal exhibition. Yeah, we have it all in shipping containers in Wellington mm. and it's it's languished there for five or six years because we just don't have the financial capability to kick it off again and get <laughs> it going. But I'm sure it would be appreciated. But yes, well, indeed, we actually have a question about, in chat from Andrew Buttery asking if you can bring it to Australia too. That would um, be nice. Well, we would love that. That's somewhere it's never been. Yeah, yeah. If there are places in Australia that um, that that person thinks would be um, relevant, send them uh, send them some information. I think we have a yeah. um, uh, a page about the exhibition on on our website. So um, yeah, we'd uh, love well, to send it to. Australia. One of the greatest sadnesses for me about the Dr. Grawbort's, um game, uh, the the mixed reality game coming to an end, was our collective aspiration as shared by Roni and us was to eventually build a massive immersive Dr. G location based experience and at the heart of that world was going to be the game hmm. um, and you would walk through it in mixed reality glasses where the whole world activates around you combining digital with the physical world that we've already created but regardless of that there still is an incredibly rich exhibition mm. waiting to be shared and just coming back to that question though Popsy, um is that i think the exciting thing where this ties back to the role-playing game and i think why the role-playing game is such an open canvas i think for for anyone to jump into is that it's all grounded by and informed by the history of science fiction um you know rich your richard's very complimentary of me coming up with all this work but it's just me um my little neural network taking all the inputs of the that I've been fascinated by and regurgitating them into this into this world through my own strange lens. Like I said, this particular design is really inspired by a thousand Venusian designs or a, a thousand little green men. Same with the the moon the moonlings or the moon men. They're um they they are a bit more of an, uh, an original design, but they're still inspired by the history of science fiction. I just reconstituted them. Uh, but they're all about that touchstone of like, I didn't want to, I wanted a Venusian to feel like you've seen this guy in a million movies. That's the way they were described. In a way, the Broadboards world is a bit like, well, those old movies and drawings and the old science fiction of yesteryear, they were a bit like when you see uh, a naturalist drawing a, a drawing, a picture of an elephant or a rhinoceros for the first time, and it's completely wrong, but they've seen one and that's their best description that they've given, relayed to the artist. Well, those old science fiction films to me are a bit like there. Uh, someone has been to Venus. They saw a bunch of stuff. They came back to Earth and they relayed that message, and it came back in this kind of lo-fi way. Well, the Grubbots world is like the realistic crystallization of all that, where it's finally come into focus. This is actually what a Venusian looks like. This is actually what a Moonling looks like. But it is all of that history of science fiction. And I think for the role-playing game, for a, a games master, dungeon master coming into this. They get to draw on all that. Not only do they get to draw on everything that Brian and his team has embellished and you know brought to life uh, in the book, they get to touch on all those history elements of the history of science fiction and pulp. And um, any that you know, that's why it's so open ended. I love I love that about it. It's in, you know, the ideas are endless. Yeah, and why why that? Why Greg has mentioned that? I just want to take my opportunity to pass my compliments on to uh, Brian, his colleague Zach, Tyler, and TJ. Uh, Brackle because of the extraordinary um, efforts and energy they have made. When, when Brian first approached us, I, I didn't know Brian, I didn't know his company. Uh, Greg and I uh, got a presentation from him 
and his wife about what they wish to do with the Dr. G world. Uh, and my wife, Tanya, Greg and I sat in and listened to this. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we felt, why not? And I knew it was going to be good because I knew that they were sincere and desired to do something well. I could never, ever have imagined in my wildest hopes of how phenomenal it actually was ultimately mm. done. And the depths at which uh, Brian's team have uh, mined our minds, mm. basically mined Greg on a near daily basis for more and more information, and then funding uh, Greg and our team to produce more original work that was required to fill out the game, even though we had so much already. And that, that I felt was a real testament to uh, the dedication he was feeling. And, and uh, you know, really a huge thanks to everyone at Crowbar Creative. But then the fact that the team, uh, Mac, Justin and Tristan at Exalted Funeral have also embraced it so fully is just, uh, they're the publisher as the publishing team and their support they've shown, hey, it's just amazing, mind bending, actually. Yeah, yeah, it really has. I mean, you filled in all the details. When I think about the world of Dr. Rawboard, I know there's thousands of drawings and, and books and so on. It feels like a gesture of a world. And so when I think about what Brian and the team have done, it's like, oh, you filled in all the gaps. It's a, you know, and, and brought it to life in a way that I, I didn't think was possible. I thought I just hinted at it. Um, but yeah, so that's a super exciting thing from the role playing uh, point of view. But now there really is a world of fabric to explore for new players. Super cool. Thank you, Brian, and all your guys. Thank you. And that dovetails a little into a question from chat from Just Gastly. He asks if you could, um, for most game masters running this system, would it be encouraged to grab random things from the attic and equip yourself like you're, I don't know, really at a junkyard rather than going to anything fancy? Good question. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah, of I think. Course. Yeah, yeah, anything and everything is possible. It all depends where your characters are coming from. Um, if you're if you're flying from Earth and you're uh, part of the Doctor Grubbord's Empire, then I think you've got the latest and greatest of deadly equipment, both deadly to anyone you pointed at and probably yourself. Um, and if you're a Venusian um, uh, revolutionary, then of course you're going to be uh, like building a ramshackle team with whatever you can get your hands on. The second-hand Doctor Grubbord wears. Um, and everything in between. I think um, it's, it, yeah, it, there's great potential. You can be the aristocrat growing them at the best of the best. And you can be a freedom fighter hero, just, you know, winging it with whatever you've got. With, so. the, with your vacuum cleaner strapped on your back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I know that you've talked about the drawing from a lot of past things for the design of the aliens, but for the landscapes of Venus and the other things, that seems a bit more fantastical than things that would be in old comics. Did you draw extra inspiration from anything? Hmm. I'd say sea life. Sea life, yeah, like, the like, ocean. I, I love Greg's fantasy worlds, and I, I sculpted and art directed and worked in that world a great deal both at miniature scale and also life-size scale and when i'm briefing it into our artists on the workshop floor that are trying to capture greg's um fantasy worlds i i have often used photographs of um sea life and coral reefs mm. um the mushroom family um uh, or the fungi family etc etc yeah but it's all got that fantastical twist that goes through greg's mind and i actually love the environments i think they're kooky and wild and i've always wanted to build venus at a full scale walkthrough experience with all of that beautiful vegetation uh, alive and yeah. in its unique qualities. A coral reef probably is the best touchstone, is it, in that it feels like plant life, but it's it's not. It's animal life, you know, in a way. Or she is it technically animal life, but it's alive. It's moving, you know, and it can it can eat it you. It can eat you. Yeah, um, it, it is the, and, and it is from the history of science fiction. Um, I'm I am channeling stuff I've seen from Jules Verne and and, and a thousand others. Um, in our film script, it literally becomes a protagonist. Eh? It, yeah. it, it is. It is. The it blood is jungle. A, the blood jungle is yeah. a character in its own right that 
Coxswain gets lost in or, yeah. or with his uh and part of it is just as an artist that's the fun stuff to draw and you can also see that's the fun stuff to sculpt because it's kind of a weird fractal thing as an artist you can just kind of lose yourself in creating these shapes and they just grow organically and you wake up 10 minutes later and you and that and these shapes have come out so um <laughs> i one of the great privileges for me and my role is i get to often watch our artists um evolve a concept live in front of me on a screen or on a piece of paper probably no more invigorating and inspirational than sitting watching alan lee do a watercolor painting because that that is a that that is where you know that the craft has even transcended uh technical achievement and has just become a a a phenomenal experience right mm. but watching greg um de develop his worlds uh on his wacom tablet into the computer and watch how he very almost grows the 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 vegetation out of the painting is very interesting and very very um very unique way to think about uh how you put a picture together you don't draw it you grow it mm, and, that's the uh, fractal aspect yeah, yeah that's really neat to watch now before we move on i think i should take exception to being lost in the blood jungle i simply wasn't done hunting <laughs> yeah fair enough fair yeah enough. we'll give you that one now for something as over the top ridiculous as things can be in the dr drawbot universe you are still seriously committed to it how do you sort of combine that commitment to authenticity while still being completely uh wild and over the top hmm. i think to me they're one and the same authenticity and being wild and over the top there so if i i'll kick off the answer and throw it to greg because once again when i watch greg work and i watch i know greg uh pretty well greg's a very dear friend of mine and we've known each other for nearly 20 years greg is extraordinarily knowledgeable on the world's political shenanigans uh incredibly well read on social issues on interpersonal cultural biological realities and just like he's talking about drawing from science fiction he also draws from the the from the sublime to the ridiculous nature of daily politics in the world and if you look even over the last hundred years what the human race and what individuals in the human race uh have actually done in the pursuit of what they believe is the right thing for their particular culture to the destruction of other cultures uh, greg is channeling a huge of that amount of that through his satirical perspective into the narrative of this world mm. yeah it's, it's a bit i love as as an artist you love patterns right finding patterns creating patterns and um and the world is full of patterns and art is just a way of re-establishing re those patterns in a way that sort of makes sense for you. Uh, that's why I, I do it. Like when you say the wild and over the top versus authentic, to me there is, I'm not that I'm wild and over the top in my ordinary life. I, I don't walk down the street screaming, not yet. Um, but I, the, I you know, the, the, that's going on in my head, my imagination the whole time, trying to unravel, make sense of the world. And then the art is a way of distilling that back together um in the world of dr robot that's just an ongoing pursuit of trying to find patterns in the craziness because it's there are there are just there are repeating patterns and that i i'd say that not just as an artist it's not just about art sorry but about culture and about politics and about all these themes keep on coming back up and uh the war to end all wars and less than 15 years later there's another, another war yeah you know it is, it is patterns and greg is a very understated individual but is able to express what's obviously churning around in your brain through two mediums, your art and then your music. But little known is that Greg is actually a member, is the lead singer and, uh, you know, guitarist of a band that now dates beyond 30 years, I mm -hmm. think. Oh, punk rock yeah, a punk rock band that is at its most extreme edge of musical expression. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair to say. Eh? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, They're all tied together. They're all, I am, I, um, you're obviously the same i 
I'm always, I get very excited by something and chase it down, like art, like writing, whatever. Then I actually get very bored very quickly. And then I want to jump into something else, into music. And then I'll get excited by something else, uh, making our video game and uh, figuring out how the hell that kind of technology works. And then I'll loop around. I'm kind of always jumping through whatever creative medium. And all of it is just to try and find meaning, trying to find patterns in the chaos and then reconstruct those in a way that uh, I can understand and then buy it and then hope that someone else can look at those patterns and understand it as well. And then hopefully get some realization of, you know, seeing deeper into the world because it, it looks like chaos. When you, when you look at the whole picture, it can look like chaos. Uh, but it's not. There's lots and lots and lots of patterns. I'm always are fascinating to find. Mus music is the ultimate in pattern making. I mean, it's it's so primal, you know. I'm always amazed and uh, in awe of artists that find a single pattern and then stay with it for their whole career. I can't do that. Uh, H.R. Giger would be a good example. I knew him. I visited him in his home. I love his work. I, I loved everything about him, his unique character. But he stayed within the medium of art for mm. his whole career. Incredibly diverse. I'm jealous of that. So yeah, uh, and then you look at uh, you know someone like Philip Jackson, the sculptor, who in his personal fine art sculpting stays within a very tight medium mm. and explores it to its nth degree. Mm. But I can't do that. No, I, I am hopping all over the place all the time. Running, my my inquisitive brain is constantly agitating for more consumption. Yeah, and I can see that entirely in you because it's not uh, to me. Yeah, those those guys. I'm jealous of what they have. They can they can discard the craft part and focus on the patterns. Um, but I get bored of the craft part. I get good enough at you know at, at the crafting of a thing. And I'm like, but I'm still after the pattern seeking. So I go like, bugger that, you know, bugger drawing or, or comics or writing. I'll figure out a different way of searching for patterns. And then I'll come back to the other ones. I, I love craft. I really do. But I, I to keep your brain alive, it's like I want to come at the problem from a new angle. So throw the craft, that particular craft away. Well, it definitely yeah. works. I think I'm rather similar in some ways. And that keeps things fresh by bouncing around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we live in that world, right? I mean, the, the world is rapidly, creatively, technologically changing. Um, it's socially, it might not be changing as fast as we think it is. I think people are just people, and it bubbles up in strange ways. But technologically, it's changing so rapidly. So uh, you kind of have to like adapt to that and um, and be excited by it because there's a million ways to express these ideas, and there are a million ways being invented all the time. You know, the, the AI stuff that's happening at the moment is super fascinating. To, ability for neural networks to generate imagery and writing and uh natural language and music and it's, it's that's a super exciting thing to figure out what people will be able to do with that and i'm playing with that every day as well yeah so. and we're never going to bottom out that because of course the neural networks of the human mind have barely been scratched mm. never mind fully open so oh, yeah the mechanisms of technology uh could activate uh future capabilities we can't even begin to dream about mm -hmm. from an artistic and yeah. storytelling and musical perspective which is so exciting yeah and history does repeat itself i i believe that war of the worlds by hg wells was written about the destructive settling of tasmania so there's some parallels with dr g there a hundred years later oh yeah 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 dr g is very much about that story and it's not specifically about uh, colonialism or um, uh, you know, as as it appears on the surface, like England going to these places, or whatever, it's really just about that metaphor of a kind of uh, a culture that's become so impenetrable can only see itself and its own virtue, going out and trying to stamping that on the on everyone else and not really listening, um, which is you know uh, that get that repeats itself a lot, you know, in a million different forms. To be uh, fair, Doctor Broadboard does have a very enticing logo. He does, and that's about a good logo. A good logo. And an unpronounceable name. Of course. I mean, if you're going to an alien planet, you might as well confuse them too. <laughs> exactly. Even now we busy. have a question here from Jack Lockhart, and I'm actually going to combine it with another one from Per Selby. They're asking if there's a chance we'll see more ray gun collectibles in the future or busts of famous people from the Dr. G universe. Hmm. Well, that's probably an answer for me to give. I would keep making a ray gun a month if we could find a market that could help us fund the production of them because we, we just love making them. And uh, 
and we like my Tanya and I have funded the production of a huge amount of stuff that we've never been out we've never put on sale and we've never been able to put on sale this this sculpture here is a great example but we don't have the ability to fund it without it being at least breaking even so it really comes down to finding a market of enthusiasts big enough that warrants um uh that that can allow us to do more stuff right mm. we started making these little ray guns which are exquisite because um they were much more within the affordable scope of people's capabilities and then for the the Wu Shen exhibition in China we did these extraordinary little busts which were digital scans from the physical clay sculptures that we did at one to one scale we did about 30 busts like this uh, at one to one scale of the characters from the Dr G world uh, based on Greg's um, paintings and then we sold these um, at the exhibition but uh, obviously with a large team of model makers on the workshop floor capable of really making any uh, extraordinary invention and our collectibles business that does very high end collectibles um, it's about recapturing that that audience that collectors mm. the the fans that love dr g enough that can allow us to make more more beautiful stuff yeah we, we did a lot of ray guns these collectible ray guns at the start of this whole thing it's where it came from and i was very much again like speaking to that that earlier idea i was very much chasing that so we made uh, a lot of those things and um and they did very very well we sold out of all of those but um and then my attention turned on to other things and so we we stopped designing ray guns and uh you know really those sort of things they need to be fostered and so it's a it's a it's a really um it's on me that we didn't keep on pushing all of those things but they're um i would love to do them again it's a case, a case of coming back to it in that realm though we have done some uh, ray gun nfts and if you go and google that on um open sea you'll find an amazing collection we did uh with non-fungible labs yeah, and we got to bring there you go and that is one of the outcomes of that and we are thinking that it's a possibility of making this new version that's just a prototype it's very lightweight um uh a new version of that particular ray gun which is called the saturn um uh so that's something we're exploring but if people want to look at the, the digital collectible side if that's something that interests them um we did some ad i think they're absolutely, absolutely beautiful absolutely extraordinary yeah, All yeah. Art directed by greg built by one of our team downstairs with support from other people within the workshop yeah there's been one set out already and i think there's another set out due out well probably in the next couple of months uh and that's something we'll keep on expanding upon and if that you know continues to go well i mean that i think it's just about our attention your attention is divided across a million things i'm busy working on a bunch of things um but i would love to make another ray gun i know people keep on asking uh, uh, but we just don't have a really good metric of how many people would actually love to pay the very extraordinary amount of money that it takes to make a full metal yeah, collectible ray gun like that. They're all handmade. They all, you know, they obviously take weeks to yeah. make. So. The, the big ones, like the Unnatural Selector, we made 50 of them and we only made 50 because it was such an extraordinarily complex thing to make. It was very expensive. I can't remember. It was several thousand dollars. Uh, they came in a whole you know wooden case you know it took nearly a year yeah to yeah massive effort and there's so much fun but it, it, it is an artistic indulgence luckily they sold um but um yeah you need to keep on making them and uh and yeah we've, we've got so many things to if do there's anyone listening in that has deep pockets that <laughs> wants more ray guns uh yeah. let's make some together yeah. and then um split the profits so, yeah yeah there you go so. and if it comes out you know there's always the opportunity i guess of doing like lower lower editions like doing one-offs and so on uh and then that in that case you're talking about a very expensive premium item but they can be made and they are freaking beautiful and it would be nice to be the one of one to own something so i i call it object fetishism right we've all got our own fetishes uh for objects that we love and uh we just love ray guns we love this sort of technology and so the opportunity to make these is so so exceptional mm. my wife's office is just directly through there uh, i can see her from here and she's got probably 
10 or 12 of the ray guns we've made over the years sitting in her office right now. She just loves them and um, treasures them. So, uh, yeah, that's it's just one of those things. Hmm. Now, I know on the Kickstarter there are some uh, stretch goals for... Uh, I'm not sure what you'd call it, the blueprints for 3D printed objects. Mm. Would yes. would that be an avenue that you could pursue perhaps in making ray guns available to the public? Let them print their own, but you come up with the design. That's totally doable. Yeah, 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 that's a lovely idea. Yeah. We are doing some really amazing stuff with this incredible company in Auckland. I would suggest they're probably New Zealand's most successful business at the moment. Uh, called uh, NFL, run by a gentleman called Aaron. And he's very inspirational around, uh, you know, co conceptual ways to get IPs out to the world, get mm. ideas to the world through digital formats. But he he is very much, we, we've been using this term in-house, uh, which we've been calling masterworks for the metaverse. What, you know, sure we're building a digital construct that we can all go and hang out in uh in the metaverse but what is the masterworks in our physical world that are complementary to the digital assets that we're able to interact with in our in our digital world and you start to think about the crossover between these sorts of things if that's where it gets really exciting and there's definitely an intersection in that mm. in that crossover very good. I have a question from Better in Writing that's asking more about specific aspects of proto and early sci-fi that you'd like to revisit and realize. Perhaps anything that's been lost to the ages over the course of cultural change. That's a good question. Man, there's so much. I think the exciting thing in the Dr. G role-playing game that Brian's explored, that I again I only hinted at in the um in the original world, is Mars. Um there's so that has that, that that's the planet that has got the richest sort of science fiction history, and of course it's back in the in people's minds eye now with you know everything that's going on um, to travel back there or to set up a colony there, which would be rad. Um, but yeah, so there's I think there's already a ton of stuff that is explored in in Brian's role playing game that is going to that I'm excited that is finally going to be out there because you've got all those ideas like the canals, the canal networks across the planet, and I think Brian's come up with some very cool things that take that in a new direction you've got the tripods um mars is very different in that uh from the other Gorbordian planets and that venus was is basically like a, a metaphor for um uh for a, a more primitive world that has an an, 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 an over-the-top new tech uh civilization turn up and just over it you know overturn everything that they're doing marsh mars is a civilization in decay where they've reached some apex and they've become lethargic or they've lost their way. Maybe they're squabbling amongst each other. And then when Earth turns up, we're like, oh, look at this place. Look at all the marbles they've built. And we start building, not literally, we start building um, McDonald's and tourist attractions and, you know, and, and putting in lots of car parks so that lots of Earth tourists can come along and marvel at what the Martians have done. Um, and I think that's a really interesting lens to look at that history through because it's it's kind of ancient egypt it's atlantis it's uh it's a very mysterious but very evolved highly technological place i think that's right with um right for exploration and for a good dm to embellish upon even further because again the history of martian science fiction is really deep and not more over the planets and the people we haven't talked about the creatures yet and you've had some very Interesting designs for creatures. Per Selby, in particular, voiced his admiration of the blue sacked Pillock. Oh, hi, Per, by the way. Per has been a great supporter and friend over the years and owns several of the ray guns, I believe. That is a, a yeah, shallow beaked Grogan sculpture. Yeah, you know, I just happened to have it on my shelf above the telly because it's, uh, uh, it's unpainted. It's the only, I'm looking for others, it's the only creature not only creature I have that I've got on the shelf, unfortunately. Well, it's, it's a bit small stuff. for a trophy, yeah. but it'll do. But yeah, um, the blue sack pillock, that's a beauty. That was sculpted by Jamie Bestwarrick. Yeah. We did a series of these bugs years ago, um, which were 
the idea that they're in a, in a wooden frame, about yay big little square thing, the sort of thing you would uh, normally put a stag beetle or a butterfly. Uh, and um, the, I, I really thought that what if you could make these crazy alien bugs that are in, indecipherable, super colorful, but you could put them alongside your your tarantula or monarch butterfly or whatever, you know, is in your collection. And they would kind of blend in, but in your, a, a, a guest to your house might come and go, and go what? What the hell's that one? Right? Make them that believable, but also that surreal that just cause you to scratch your head. Yeah, and those, those we handmade in the mm. workshop, individually putting in every hand. Hair. Yeah, hand, yeah, hand yeah. flocked, hand painted. Yeah, crazy. Dordie, one of our incredible painters, just slaved away on those. They're, they are their own Fabergé eggs unto themselves. Yeah, I it's agree. Beautiful. They're some of the most beautiful things we've ever made. Yeah. 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 Fabergé bugs, I suppose. Fabergé bugs, yeah. <laughs> we have a few people, Andrew Buttery in particular, asking if there can be uh, more digital projects in the works because of the limitations of cost and production for the physical ones. I know you've mentioned yeah, the I'll... Dr. Draw bought video games and the virtual experience you're working on, but, well, mm. we're a greedy lot and we'd like more, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, probably can. There are other things percolating along in the background like that. I'm, I'm loath to give too much detail, but there, yeah, uh, Richard mentioned Non Fungible Labs, who are a, a company here doing in, uh, NFTs, and um, they are making actually really interesting interactive stuff of which into which we are plugging into. So there are ray guns there. If you own uh, one of the NFT ray guns, it will be able to come to life in one of their worlds very soon. So that's going to get um, become part of the metaverse, as you as you, if you like that, and. Uh, we are actually doing something like, yeah, we're doing some neat, they have a, a thing called the Atom Car Club, which is basically a, a car club for car enthusiasts, cars from the, the real through to the surreal, and uh, and we're doing something exciting in that realm, but yeah, I think. we can't tell you too much It's yet, some man. of my favorite automo or mechanical design that I've done so far. That if, if you have tuned in on this nerdiest of nerdy uh, podcasts, you just freaking wait to see what he has designed and our dear colleague matthew is building oh they're neat yeah i, I cool. am so desperate to build the one that we've modeled life size life size it is i want to drive it up the sh we've driven sherman tanks uh warthogs uh <laughs> other crazy things up and down the street in our suburban uh little mirror of miramar outside our door but um I, I, I've even pushed the Queen Elizabeth up this road, <laughs> not literally the, 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 the Queen, but the model of well, the ship of the Queen. Oh, and, she's uh, a good sport, I, she wouldn't uh, mind. Yeah, <laughs> and the thought of um, building this car, oh dear me. Yeah, I've done, done a whole series. Anyway, that, that that's coming. And 3D models of those, I think, could be spectacular, but they will be uh, both beautiful NFTs and interactable. So. Um, so that's cool. And there's some other bits and pieces. We always got lots of stuff percolating on in the background. So yeah, there's, there's digital stuff coming. Yeah. There's definitely an audience for it. I know Dan Jones in particular wanted you to nudge Peter Jackson in the ribs a few times and see if you can entice him. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Yeah, okay. Let me see. I think that's covered most of the questions in chat and that I had prepared. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about off the cuff? I've got Brian, would you like to say something? Mm. Yeah, right I've ahead. got a question, and I'm stop me because I'm not entirely sure how much you you can or want to talk about this. But um, your new comic project, can we talk about that at all? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I I, I was curious um, how. You went from, and I know this is there are years in between, but how you went from the Dr. Gordborts universe, which is so technologically focused and so kind of material focused. It's it, it sprang mm. from the gun, from the weapons, and and it centers around the technology and consumerism and all of that. Is it pure coincidence or something uh, subconsciously that made you have this new project, which is kind of the polar opposite of that? I, I, I guess yeah which you might want yeah. to tee it up a little bit what it is because people yeah might. I should talk so i'm it's something i'm working on at the moment there's a little i hint a little bit at on my, on my um on my instagram it's a world called one path and it is a prehistoric world about and a story about 
um, a character called One Path, uh, a tribe of prehistoric pre uh, cave women living in, you know, in the most basic, primal, visceral, deadly setting you can imagine. Of course, you know, the life of, you know, of people who really don't get beyond, if you, you're old when you get to 20, basically, is a short way to put it. You know, it's the hardest possible life. But it's not just the prehistoric world that we know. It's a kind of a surreal world in the sense that it has dinosaurs. Their worst enemies are not uh, wolves, you know, or bears. They're T-Rexes. And um, that's and, the basic of And raptors. And, and rap other, yeah, other. It's, it's a violent, violent world where they are clinging onto life uh, in the, by, the, by the ends of their very gnarled fingernails. And because the dinosaurs are a food source for them, they have to yeah go up against them though. and yeah and because yeah to the to the question Grudwitz is satirical it's funny it's ludicrous it's a send-up it's playing with um with science fiction and uh but yeah this is there's no science in it <laughs> there's dinosaurs and there's people hanging on to life uh by their teeth and it's not funny <laughs> there's no jokes in it there's no satire it's really about what matters in life i suppose i in fact i'm doing it to try and just understand like i say when i make create fiction it's really to find patterns to understand the world myself mm -hmm. i do it completely motivated by that and if anyone enjoys it after the fact it's a massive bonus and, and i'm very grateful for it but i do it to try and understand the universe um and so one path is my version at the moment of, of trying to understand reality and what matters what you know what's what's and, primal to all of us and for us to understand the universe we might watch a few podcasts listen to old lex and his interviews you know we might uh tune into a bit of um national geographic for greg to understand the universe is greg doing a body of work over a year that would take a mere mortal maybe 10 to 15 years to produce if they were working full time every day uh, every frame is a fine art painting and a single page can have five to eight frames. And uh, how many pages have you done so far? I think I've done about 120 pages. It'll so be 170 by the time it's... So let's say this fire. So, so, so 700 paintings to the equivalent level of the ray gun I showed you has been done thus far mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. So it's a hell of a way to figure out a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's not a reaction uh, brian to dr g it's not like oh i've done with that now i'm going to do this it's much something much more instinctual than that and it is definitely a re reaction to the pandemic because i started i had the idea a long time before the pandemic but then suddenly being at home and having our magic leap project which was uh so inspiring and so rewarding but having it overturned and changed quickly made me think oh well you know i have to find there's you know this is a perfect time to tell this other story and and there's almost no rational at least not that i can explain reasoning behind it other than once you open that turn that faucet on you just let it come out whatever comes out and and that's what came out and like i say it couldn't be more opposite but that's not on purpose uh it's just a yeah it, it is one of the uh best stories i've ever come up with and i i also this this time around i co-created it i've um it's my story but my two very good friends, Andy Lanning, who's an amazing comics writer. He's helped me fashion it and, and turn it into something coherent. And a friend I made, um, Nicholas Boschia, who's a comedian from Australia, very, very funny dude, but also a brilliant writer, uh, has helped me tailor it into something. So, um, And it's so funny when he says writing because there are no words. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, There's not a lot of dialogue in it. There's yeah. a lot of biting. Lots of biting, lots of yee. I'm making jokes about it. I can make when you when you read it, you won't, won't laugh. <laughs> quite dark. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's exciting. I'm I'm you know, I'm actually uh, I've been doing it now actually for two years since the start of the pandemic, and I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel because I've been hammering away at it for ages, and um, I'm getting close to the point where I can see possibly publishing it. So that will be the next step. Well, the grim and the humorous are both aspects of life that we need to explore. And I yeah. have actually, yep. on the humorous side, a personal question for Richard. Who is that fellow in your lap? Because I think his whiskers are better than mine. Ah, well, <laughs> this is my own little um, Venusian alien. This is Lottie. This is our dog, but um, utterly, I'm devoted to her and her to me. So um, she's got me through the pandemic with her affection and her 
devotion. But uh, yeah, she's been asleep at my feet the whole time we've been talking in her bed, but she decided she needed a cuddle. So uh, yeah. she's, jo she's joined us. Yeah, we've got 35 dogs at the moment in the workshop. Uh, we've always had dogs here. Um, anyone can bring their dog to work and we want the more, the merrier. Um, we now have to have a dog policy because they used to just run wild like packs through the workshop, but they'd knock people off their feet. <laughs> and uh, we have a, I, I call it the, um, uh, the one wee, the, 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 the one vomit, two poo, three wee rule. But we actually, you know, we do have to try and control the bloody things a little bit because um, <laughs> it can get a bit crazy. But uh, it is lovely having them in our building. It's all fun and games until the Great Dane gets riled up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, Tyler, before we sign off, I just wanted to say, um, absolutely love what you do and thank you for being coxswain for us today sorry coxswain am i talking to tyler or coxswain i'm not sure but uh i became aware of your channel um just randomly i was searching uh trying to find some dr Grodbort's. actually brian probably asked me a question and then i'm like oh how does that work and so i googled it uh and look <laughs> instead of searching our own database i used google to look through the history of dr Grodbort's, and then i found your video uh, where you brought one of my comics to life and i was like god damn i was just inspired and grateful and thought this person cares and has done an amazing job um and it was yeah it's one of my favorite stories that i've written in the dr grubbots world because most of the grubbots stories are very they're jokes they're big long jokes with lots of violence in them um and you brought that to life in such a beautiful way and uh and yeah i'm really really grateful for it so thank you very very much now it's my pleasure it's a labor of love as much as it is you for you Great. Well, well thank, thank you everyone you, for thank tuning you for in. Listening everyone and uh Brian and Tyler and obviously Zach and TJ, Justin, Matt and Kristen, thank you for your support of our world and uh it could not be more enjoyable the last year doing this with you and we can't wait to start playing ourselves and uh I hope that lots and lots of people think to explore the world of Dr. G through your game. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you for our wonderful chat members for saying hello and posing some questions. So, once again, oh. this is Greg, Brian, Richard, and your old friend Coxie signing off. So long, chaps. <laughs> See ya.